All right, so problem 21, we have data on homes that were recently sold in a certain town that included the area of the home, and it was reported in square feet. The table below shows summary statistics of the reported areas in square feet. Here we got the mean, the minimum, Q1, median, Q3, maximum standard deviation. An auditor determined that there was an error that was made in the reported areas and that all of the areas should have been 100 square feet greater than what was reported. The areas were corrected and new summary statistics were reported. So what are the interquartile range and standard deviation of the corrected area? All right, so this is a clever one. So, um, so, the, so again, let's, let's, let's go through this kind of carefully. So they had an error and that the error was that they should have all, all these dimensions, all these measurements should have been a hundred square feet greater or all the areas, I'm sorry, all, all the areas. Oh, was it? yeah, the areas should have been a hundred square feet greater than what was reported. Now, when you um when you add let's say so what you're going to do is essentially you're going to be um adding 100 feet you know adding 100 feet to like you know to be to these values sort of so um what i mean by that is um when you um when you when you just add when you, when you well, actually when you just add a number is actually if this i don't I mean i can i you can get technical when you change basically um, we, we, this is called like a linear transformation. You've probably seen like an AX plus B maybe in chapter two, something like that, where you just, you know, where you, um, have a multi you multiplier is A, B is what you're adding. When you add, when you just add a number to all the data values, so if you add like hundred feet to everything, it's not going to change the act, the measures of spread. It does not change measures of spread. It'll change actual values. But it doesn't change measures of spread, so it's going to change the you know the mean. It's going to change the minimum. It'll change it'll change all these values by adding a hundred, but it won't actually change. But it won't change the standard deviation, and it won't change the the, the range. Because think about it: if I add a hundred feet to Q one and a hundred feet to Q three, this just goes from eighteen oh four. This goes from eighteen oh four, and this becomes nineteen oh six. So the difference from 1704 to 1806, that's 102. But that's that's the same distance from 1804 to 1902 or 1906. They're both 102 away. So even though their values changes changed, their measure, the measures of spread don't change. How far away they are don't change. So the standard deviation won't change, um, range won't change, um, IQR won't change, those types of statistics. And this is pretty intuitive. You just, if you just think of like, let's say you have a brother that's four feet and you're six feet tall. If both of you became one foot taller, yeah, you would, he would go from five, he would go to five feet and you would go to seven feet, but you would still only be two feet away. So your spread doesn't change. So then the answer would just be that these, you keep the same values for the IQR and deviation. And so it would just be A. Stays at one. Stays at one o two. Stays at that. Number twenty two. A two sample t test of the uh, hypotheses H O mu one minus mu two equals zero versus the alternative mu one minus mu two is greater than zero. Produces a p value of 0 0.03, which the following must be true. Okay, so. Okay, so. This is this is this is referring to a one-sided test. Remember, so um, a one-sided test, you know, if, it's, if you find if you're talking about you know being greater than or less than something, um, but if it's a two-sided test, you're going to say not equal to right. So you're going to include both ends. So what I'm getting at is the way these match up is um, so let's take um. A normal curve, for example, a little bit of review. If you're going to make a 90% confidence interval, 
So from here to here, you're gonna have 90% of the total area from one end to the other. So you're gonna have 10% left over, or you can have 5% to one side and 5% to the other. Okay, so um, this is only accounting for one side though. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get back to this in a second because this is kind of how I would want to see. With 95% of the confidence interval, you're gonna have 5% left over or two and a half percent on both sides, right? Same idea, except you're just a little more spread apart. 95% in the middle, you're capturing the middle 95%. Two and a half percent to the left, two and a half percent to the right. And then with the 99%, this is going to be the most, this is going to be the widest confidence interval, assuming you have the same data. But you're going to have half a percent to one side and another half of the percent to the other. Now, so what am I getting at is um, when when um when you reject the null hypothesis it's because your p value is less than your alpha level the p value is less than alpha so that's your hypothesis test but when you're to talk, when you're trying to look at a common interval you got to make sure you take you, you account for double the value because the percentages become double so a, a common interval is like double or like a two-sided test always so um, if we have a p-value over here on one side, so we have 3% over here, you would have another 3% over here too, right? But you're still, you're still good. You're still going to be outside. You're still going to be outside of the 90% confidence interval because that means you're only, you have 94% in the middle. It's three and three, okay? So um, here you're you're gonna you're gonna basically say oh well I'm gonna I'm gonna reject H O because you know um my in other words your ninety percent comments interval didn't capture those and didn't capture didn't fall in here so you're gonna reject H O so zero is not containing here because because um zero is not a plausible value. Now, but in the now in a ninety five percent confidence interval, though, that three percent interferes with with this portion and this portion. So you see, like a little bit comes inside the confidence interval. So your confidence interval, your confidence interval doesn't um, allow you to reject the null hypothesis. So since you're not going to reject the null hypothesis, that means it captures. It's going to contain HO. Or, I'm mean, sorry, it's going to contain zero, or you can, you know, contain your null hypothesis value zero. So two is going to be true. True is going to be true. I mean, two, yeah, two will be true. Number one won't be true. And that same thing, since um, a 99% is even wider, it's definitely going to capture, you know, your, your null hypothesis value. Because you got three percent and only half percent left over, so it's going to be the same conclusion with the ninety-five percent one. You're going to you're going to fail to reject H O. So your your um comfortable is going to capture zero still. It's still going to contain zero. So two and three two and three will be correct. Then your answer will be B. A uh, medical doctor uses the diagnostic test to determine whether a patient has arthritis. The treatment will be prescribed only if the doctor thinks the patient has arthritis. This situation is similar to using a null and alternative hypothesis to decide whether to prescribe the treatment. The hypotheses might be stated as follows. HO, the, the patient does not have arthritis. HA, the patient does have arthritis. The patient does have uh, arthritis. Um, okay, so which of these represents a type two error for these hypotheses? 
Okay, so it says to remember what um, type one and type two is. I mean, you have two types of error. Type one. Type one is when, type one, let me just say it first. So I got messed up. A type one is when you reject the null hypothesis when it's actually true. Like you made a mistake, you made a mistake. You rejected it, meaning you thought that the person had, you thought the person has arthritis um, when they actually don't. So type one is reject HO when HO is true. A type two, very similar, just keep, just remember the wording, you fail to reject HO. Fail to reject HO. And since this is an error, that means that the alternative is true. So you fail to reject HO when the alternative is true, because again, it's a mistake, an error. So you fail to reject the null hypothesis when the alternative is true. So in context, you fail to, to detect that the patient has arthritis. You, you, in other words, you think that they don't, but they actually do. Because again, um, the alternative is arthritis. So the truth, the truth, the alternative is that, or the truth is that he actually has arthritis. But since you make a mistake, that means that you don't think he has arthritis. So you, you diagnose him and say, no, you're right, you're fine. You, you don't got no arthritis, you're good. But he actually does. So that's gonna be type two. So that would be B. Point four. Ball, but I hold you want to estimate the difference between the mean body length of green and brown stink bug. A random sample of 20 green stink bugs has a mean body length of 16.22 millimeters and a standard deviation of 1.34 millimeters. A random sample of 20 brown stink bugs has a mean body length of 13.41 millimeters and a standard deviation of 0.73 millimeters. What is the standard error of the difference green minus brown between the sample? Okay, so you can just um, look, refer to your formula sheet. Just remember what um, standard error is just another way to think of standard deviation, but standard deviation of sampling distributions. Um, but usually, it's like the one I have, I'm going to show you that. Um, it's probably going to be labeled somewhere. But again, you become comfortable with whatever form that you're going to be using. I think they're usually always the same, but sometimes throughout the school year, maybe your teacher, professor, but like, like, hasn't used the form, like formatted one. Anyways, so. We're looking at the difference in means. So standard error over here, and here we got the difference in means. So this is our formula. So the standard deviation of the first sample squared over the sample size, plus the standard deviation of the second sample squared over the second sample size, all square root. So we got one group with um, for the, 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 the green skin bugs, 1.34 squared at has a sample size of 20 plus the second sample for the, for the brown skin bugs. Has a standard deviation of 0.73, so 0.73 squared. It also has a sample size of 20. So they're both over 20, all square rooted, and it looks like we need to look for the correct representation. And I wonder if they're looking to see if you know your algebra. I hope you do. Sometimes I worry, sometimes my students will do better on the stats than the Algebra part of the problem. Anyways, um, you can combine these fractions, but don't change the denominators. It's going to be all over twenty. So it's going to be let's see, it's going to be let me see. 
Don't add 20. Don't, don't add. Please don't make it 40. Don't make that mistake. Um, answer to C. This is this equivalent to that? Just combine the fractions into one. All right, so I hope that helps. Good luck.